Hey, Costa here. Today we're going to take a look at Atari specific implementation details for PPO. In our last video, we have covered 11 general implementation details with PPO. In today's video, we'll continue this journey and take a look at 9 Atari specific implementation details. A quick reminder is you can find out where these implementation details come from by checking out my blog post. At the end of this video, you'll know how to use PPO to train agents to play the Atari game Breakout. In particular, our performance would match Stable Baseline 3's PPO, reaching about 400 episodic return in Breakout. You may find our episodic return on the left looks a little bit noisy. That is because we record the unprocessed raw episodic return from the environment, and we can always smooth it later. Without further ado, let's get started. Our first step is to go to the repo and make a copy of the ppo.py and rename it to ppo underscore atari.py. Then we're going to use our ID spider to open the newly created file. Here we're going to change the gym ID to breakout no frame skip dash v4, which is the unmodified breakout gym environment. Next, I'm going to scroll down and set up a ray statement here so that we can run the script and play around with the vector environment. If you recall from our last video, we can check out the action space like this. Here, the agent has four discrete actions, which are no operation, fire, moving right, and moving left. We can also check out the single observation space like this, and we see an observation is a 210 by 160 image with three channels. It's very important to understand that the original implementation does a lot of pre-processing to the environment. Let us import the Atari pre-processing wrappers from the Stable Baselines 3 library. Then we're going to implement the makeN function as follows. Notice the setup is the same as the previous makeN function, where we would use a record episode statistics and record video wrapper. The only difference is that we would use these wrappers to do pre-processing of the environment. I am now going to remove the previous make end function. Our first implementation detail is the no op reset env wrapper. Here, if we command click on the wrapper, VS Code will take us to the source code. According to the documentation, this wrapper samples initial states by taking random number of no ops on reset. Here we see it implements the reset function of the gym wrapper. Every time the breakout no frame script dash before environment gets reset, this wrapper samples a random number of no ops between 0 and no op max equals 30, then execute these no ops and return the initial observation. According to the corresponding papers, this wrapper adds stochasticity to the environments. The second implementation detail is the max and skip env wrapper. Here we can go check out the source code again. The first thing the wrapper does is to skip four frames by default and it will repeat the agent's last actions on the skip frames. According to the DQM paper, this technique is introduced to save computational time. This wrapper also takes the maximum pixel values over the last two frames. And according to the DQM paper, this is for dealing with Atari environment quirks. The third implementation detail is the episodic live env. Here we check out the code again. For games where there is a live counter, such as Breakout, this wrapper will treat the end of life as the end of episode, returning done equal to true for every lost life. Note that this is also a training detail in the original DQM paper. The fourth implementation detail is the fire reset and wrapper. Let's check out the source code of the wrapper. So some Atari environments are stationary until the first fire action is being performed. And this wrapper will automatically do the fire for us so that the agent doesn't have to learn. Here is a funny thing. I couldn't really find any reference to this wrapper in the original papers. Furthermore, based on the discussion thread on OpenAI baselines, no one seems to know where this wrapper comes from. Folks at DeepMind even outright suggest they don't use a fire reset amp at all. So... Our fifth implementation detail is the clip reward amp. 
Here, we check out the source code again. And what this wrapper does is to clip the sum of rewards from the four skipped frames to the range of negative one, one. As suggested by the DQM paper, this wrapper helps deal with different reward scales from various games. The sixth implementation detail is the image transformation wrappers. It's a two steps process to convert the image to grayscale, then resize it to 84 by 84, as shown in the DQM paper. Note the original implementation uses the warp frame wrapper to achieve the same purpose, but here we use these two wrappers because they play nicer with the GM's frame stack wrapper. Also, there is a minor bug with the resize wrapper and we need to apply it before the grayscale wrapper. The seventh implementation detail is the use of frame stack. Here, we use a frame stack wrapper to stack the four past observations together as a single observation. This technique is documented in the DQM paper and intuitively it could, for example, help the agent identify the velocity of moving objects. Let's test out this change on our spider IDE. Here, we see the action space remains the same. However, the observation space now has a different shape. Here, we have an 84 by 84 image with four channels or four stacked frames. The eighth implementation detail is a convolutional neural network from the DQM paper that is used to calculate the hidden features for the policy and value heads. If you recall our neural network setup, the actor and critic have their own respective networks. However, this could be a waste of computational power since the hidden layers are the same and only the output heads are different. To address this, let us create a shared network for feature extraction. Notice here the shared network corresponds to the first three convolutional layers in the original DQM paper, which can be visualized as follows. Then I'm going to move the rays to a different place of the code to help debug. Here we can run the code. And when it's finished, we're going to check out the shape of the extracted features by doing agent.network.nextops.shape. Here we see the 84 by 84 image with four channels is being reduced to a seven by seven image with 64 channels. Our next step is to flatten these extracted features and also create a linear layer that takes the input of the flattened features. At this point, the network outputs a hidden representation which we'll use for the actors and critics head. Now, the beauty of having the get action and value function is that we can do hidden equals not network x and we can replace the actors and critics input with the hidden's output. Also, don't forget to modify the get value function correspondingly. The ninth implementation detail is that the image observation is scaled to the range of 0, 1. The image observation has a range of 0 to 255, but it is divided by 255 so that it gets into the range of 0 to 1. Our final step is to match the hyperparameters that was used in the original implementation. Here, we we'll modify the total time steps to be 10 million, change the numms to be 8, and change the clip range to 0 0.1. That is it for the Atari implementation details and I can remove the race and give it a run. Here it has about 100 SPS, which is very slow. So we're going to use a GPU machine to speed things up. Here, let us do NVIDIA-SMI to check the GPU exists. And then we're simply going to run the script. As we can see, the script runs with a much higher SPS. We can also go to the experiments run page to see the metrics being streamed live. While we wait for the experiment to finish, let me show you something really cool. I'm going to compare this experiment with some experiments that I've done a year earlier. Here, I'm in my project dashboard and I'm going to check out the report section, create a new report, and just give it a dummy name. Then I type forward slash to get the components menu, from which I'll select panel grid. Here we see a run set containing the tracked experiments in the current project. But now I am going to deselect this run set, create another run set, and retrieve the experiments that I've been working on in a separate project. There are hundreds of experiments in this project, but I'm only interested in the PPO breakout related experiments, so I'm going to apply various filters. 
After this is done, I'm going to toggle the visibility for the past experiments. Then we create a panel and select line plot. I'm also going to change the default axis to global step, which is what we use to keep track of environment steps. Notice the episodic return curves looks very rough, so we're going to apply a smoothing parameter and click OK. We can also utilize the flexibility of the UI to resize the window to make it look nicer. Next, I'm going to select the default run set and toggle the visibility for the experiment we just ran. Notice the chart hasn't been updated, and that is because past experiments use a different y-axis of episode reward, which is a technically ambiguous term. To address this, we simply add the episodic return of this experiment. We have just joined experiments from two completely separate projects, and by zooming in, we can see the experiment we just ran is rapidly catching up with the experiments that I have done over a year ago. So this is looking good that our agent will achieve 400 episodic return at the end of training. Fast forward a bit, this is the finished experiment. We can see that our agent on average achieves the episodic return of 400. Scrolling up, we can see the policy loss has this interesting arc shape, and we can see the videos of the agents playing the game. By clicking on the download button located at the top right of the video, I get a pop-up window. In this window, we can see that our agent plays the game really well, achieving about 400 episodic return in the end. And by scrolling the slider to the beginning of the training, we see the agent's behavior is significantly worse. To sum it up our changes in ppoatari.py, we first import the preprocessing wrappers from stable baseline 3, then modify the gym ID, total timestamps, non-mans, clip coefficient, then actually use these preprocessing wrappers, and finally change the neural networks. And everything else is the same. This concludes our video. Thanks so much for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to comment down below. I also encourage you to check out the links in the video description where you can find my source code and the blog posts on the implementation details. Thank you, and I'll see you in the next video.